What a treat to have the opportunity to meet and speak with Kater Shakoy. Uh, Kater is a yoga teacher, a meditation practitioner and teacher, a cranial sacral therapy body worker. She has just written a new book called The TMJ Handbook, A Therapeutic Guide to Relieving Jaw Tension and Pain with Yoga and Mindfulness. Man, I'm so happy to meet you, Kater. How are you feeling today? <laughs> Great to meet you as well. I'm happy to be here. Oh, well, thank you. My good friend, Michael Shea, uh, came and visited the other day and he said, I really think you should uh, bring Cater onto the show. And so then he loaned me your book and I'm, I've am i been really enjoying checking it out. And so I'm just happy to have this chance to meet a fellow yoga practitioner, teacher, body worker. Um, you're located in Northern California. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. The San Francisco Bay Area. Beautiful. How long have you been there? Um, long time. <laughs> um, right. yeah, I moved here at my Saturn return as so many of us do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. I saw some of your photos on, on Instagram. It looks beautiful. The, the beach, the ocean, pictures of the moon, some flowers. It looks like the natural beauty where you live is quite spectacular. We're very lucky here for sure. Yeah. That's cool. When I when I went through your bio and saw some of the people that you studied with, um, you've had a you have a very impressive um, resume, and I'm curious if we start in the world of yoga, where and what is your history in relation to yoga practice? How did you first get turned on to yoga? Yeah, thanks. Um, I had a chronic illness when I finished college. I was a, an athlete throughout high school and college. And my last year of college, I was kind of like a steam engine running out of steam. And that, there wasn't really an explanation for it. I was from our view, very, very healthy. And they were like testing me for brain tumors, which thankfully was not right, um, or was not what was happening. And so after graduating, at some point, I began to research health and healing because I wasn't getting help from conventional medicine. And, um, you know, I just, I just reached a turning point where it was like, okay, I'm tired of beating my head against a wall. There must be some simple things that I could do uh, to be in less pain each day was how my mind kind of reframed it. And so I went to research health and healing at, at the local bookstore and, you know, it was like a light bulb turning on, like I found the health and healing aisle. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the books I read had a lot of suggestions and they were like, try yoga, try meditation. You know, so this was back 1980, yeah, early 80, no, nine, I graduated from college in 90. So 91, 92, Boston area. Um, so yeah, try yoga, try meditation, try uh, this vitamin protocol, try a vegetarian diet. Uh, try acupuncture, Chinese medicine, all of which was way out of my familial cultural paradigm. And there was a lot of immediate resonance for me. So I was curious and receptive. So I started to try things. And I went to a yoga class in Boston. I think it was in somebody's house or else it was in the in a church basement. You know, it was before there were many yoga studios. And uh, before the class began, I walked into the room and was like, oh, this is what I want to do with my life, mm. <laughs> which might sound very strange, but there was just a sense of reconnection for me. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And similarly with meditation and then with uh, energy healing. Very cool. And I saw that you are a certified international yoga therapist. Did I get that right? Isn't it C-I-A-Y-T? It's International, international Association Thank you. of Yoga Therapy. So yeah. you become a certified yoga therapist. And I also noticed that you've spent a lot of time studying Iyengar yoga. Um, how do you see Iyengar yoga and yoga therapy blend together? Do they support one another? Do you see big differences between the two? How have you blended those two worlds together? Yeah, it's a good question. Yoga therapy is vast. So people can do widely different forms of yoga and it can have a therapeutic 
Uh oh, we got a little glitch. Let me wait for it to come back in. We might have had a. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. You Peter. might have a very different approach to yoga right. therapy than I do, or than uh, have a kind of an umbrella uh, application. And they just want to know there's a depth of study and that there is practical application. Um, so Iyengar yoga certainly has therapeutic application. And my, I did not take a specific yoga therapy course because my training at the Iyengar Yoga Institute in San Francisco is recognized to have therapeutic application. So those uh, applicants, as well as those who are have completed um, the introductory levels of certification through the Iyengar Yoga National Association are pretty much going to be accepted to the yoga therapy uh, credential because there's a recognition of the training involved. Nice. Amazing. I've heard incredible things about the Iyengar Institute in San Francisco. Can you paint a little bit of a picture for me what it's like when you go there? Yeah, well, um, I, I actually think it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, wow. Did it close <laughs> yeah, down? This is like a breaking news. Yeah, I think the <laughs> pandemic, the pandemic really did it in, you know, oh. so I think it's just in the last uh, uh, couple of months that they've decided to dissolve the organization. Wow. And it's been around for 50 years. So, yeah, you know, 50 that's the years. Like a staple in the Bay Area for yoga, right? Like, I'm, yeah, I'm and really a national you know, a, a national model in some way. I mean, it's certainly recognized around the country and even internationally. You know, when I trained wow. there, yeah. people were coming internationally to come and live in the San Francisco Bay Area for a couple of years to do that training, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, so, that, would have been, that must have been hard having that close. I mean, that sounds, how did you take that news? Yeah, I was surprised. I was interested and curious. I haven't taught there in years. So, you know, there's, we can talk a lot about Iyengar yoga and my relationship to it, but, you know, cause there's some really big shadows. So there's some tremendous, um, benefits to the training for sure. And there's some really big shadows in the organization, uh, and in the structure and in, you know, they, they can, they can become systemic in terms of how people are trained. So I had to unlearn some things yeah. and maybe that's always true in our lives. We have to find our own mm. way. Um, Great point. And I have heard a lot of it. I bet you know a ton more than I do, but maybe let's keep moving along so that because <laughs> we, we there are shadows everywhere, aren't there? And um, but let's touch upon it. But I want to keep going a little bit in relation to I saw that you studied a little bit with Judith Lassiter. Yeah. She's amazing. I had a chance yeah. to uh, uh, um, interview her here on the podcast and I, I loved it. She was incredible. Did Did, did you learn a lot from her? Yeah, I studied with her some. Uh, she was actually one of the teacher trainers. She doesn't. She didn't teach much in the teacher training program at the uh, Iyengar Institute in San Francisco, but she did teach occasionally. And so that's part of where I met her. She did teach during the time that I was there. Nice. And, you know, Judith is really, really clear. Um, and she has a, a, a confident manner and a generous and kind presence mm. and very respectful. Um, yeah. And so I certainly learned a lot from her. She was one of my uh, people who signed off on my preparation for the Iyengar assessments. And um, yeah, I have enjoyed working with Judith. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I saw in the realm of meditation, you've had an opportunity to, did you study with the insight meditation? Yeah, uh, primarily what we call in the West insight meditation, vipassana. Vipassana is sometimes misunderstood as being uh, exclusively related to the um, the Goenka, the Goenka lineage, but in fact, vipassana is just the uh, the Pali term for insight meditation. It translates literally to insight meditation yes. so in the west we've mostly uh changed that to be in like the insight meditation society in barry massachusetts and there's one here locally in redwood city and there are smaller insight organizations around the country i have had a chance to take some 10-day retreats in the guanca style but i have not had a chance to go to the insight meditation have you experienced both or not the guanca and solely the insight style 
Yeah, um, it's a good question. I haven't studied a lot with Goenka. One of my primary teachers was Ruth Dennison, who is a peer of Goenka. They were actually training together in uh, in um, Burma, um, and they wow. were yeah they were credentialed by the uh, empowered by the same teacher, um, and Goenka was uh, kind of put in charge of all the after the passing of their teacher was kind of put in charge of all the ordained teachers. Um, so I have practiced some in Goenka style community and listen to um, audio recordings. I haven't done a Goenka style 10 day retreat. I'm, I'm familiar with the, with the practice and with Got the it. system. Got yeah. it. Wonderful. Do you still currently practice meditation? Oh yeah. <laughs> do you yeah practice fundamental to daily life. <laughs> daily practice. Nice. Absolutely. And do, you, yeah. do you stay within the framework of the Vipassana technique? in your daily practice or have you, you know, I've had a chance to practice with Michael and he's introduced me to so many wonderful Tibetan Buddhist meditation techniques. I'm curious if you've also branched and in, out into a wide array. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I've been practicing now for about 35 years mm. you know, I began these practices in 1990. So, you yeah. know, variety is the spice of life, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've certainly insight meditation is, is my home and I've spent, uh, you know, I've been doing that for 35 years and, you know, I've had some exposure to Zen and more recently the last decade or so more of the Tibetan uh, Vajrayana style, and last year, I've been doing a, a, an intensive program in the Vajrayana tradition. Wow. So, um, but they all become, they're, they're like different flavors of the same thing. So it's quite, uh, and it's skillful means like the Buddha himself, he taught, he taught individual techniques to whoever was in front of him, right? And that's the intent is like, um, especially after you practice for a while, so especially for me at this point, I think of it as like, you know, when you have a glass, uh, uh, a jar full of rocks, you know, and then you pour the sand over it and the sand goes into the little tiny cracks, you know, yeah. or if you pour, if you have a full glass of ice and you pour the water over it and then the water fills in, it's like that. It's like filling in the gaps in awareness, you nice. know, so yeah. applying different techniques because, you know, the mind is very challenging. We need to keep working <laughs> with it. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and then you you and then this whole other world that you've branched into in relation to massage therapy and cranial sacral therapy can you give me a little bit of understanding of what modalities and or uh what style of training you're you're focused on mostly these days yeah thanks i have I haven't done a lot of massage therapy. I had a little bit early in my training, although I knew it was never my focus, but it was just because I wanted a little bit of that background. I began with energy healing. And it was really a spontaneous experience um, back in the era that we started with, where it was like, oh, I went to a yoga class. I was trying to heal from chronic illness and went to yoga class. It was like, oh, I'm home, you know? And then I went to a Buddhist center and was like, oh, I'm home. Uh, and then a little bit later, I wanted to go, my mind was saying, oh, we, I want to live in an ashram. And I was like, okay, I don't know what an ashram is, but we can do that. Cause I like learned to listen to myself, you know? So like, okay, okay. You know? Yes. And uh, so I was visiting Kripalu Center back many, many years ago, back when it was still an ashram, you know, in the early uh, 1990 or 1991, around then. Is this and, when, was Amrit? The yeah, son? he was still, still there. Wow. Yeah. So you got to experience all that too. You've, yeah. I'd yeah. Love you. Okay. I'll let you keep yeah. going. <laughs> we right. can talk about that another time. <laughs> another shadow. Another shadow. <laughs> Lurking out Shadows. of it. Okay. Yes. Human, um, humans have shadows. It's yes. part of our nature. And that's why we have to keep filling in the gaps in our <laughs> <Yeah>. awareness. <laughs> and, and exploring, right? Like all of a sudden, like, wait a minute, I had no idea there's gonna be that much shadow going on. And now how am I going to process all this training I've been studying and doing, but then I have this shadow element come into play and, and it sometimes changes everything, but I'm so happy to hear you. I'm not alone. So, yeah. but I'm curious, can you keep talking about your Kripalu experience? Yeah. So I was there uh, visiting. I was, I was, I think I might've been doing a trial residence stay or something. I don't know. I was there as a working guest and I, um, I was having a little bit of a relapse uh, of chronic fatigue. I wasn't feeling well. 
And somebody on my work team who was also visiting said, I think I can help you. And so then they found a room and they brought me just for a quiet space. And they brought me in there and said, stand here. And I stood there in the middle of the room and then they did these sweeping gestures over my body without actually touching me. And I, uh, I felt all this stuff changing in me. And I kind of blurted out, what are you doing? <laughs> and at the same moment, my mind said, I want to learn how to do that. Mm. You know, so it piqued a, a deep curiosity in me. And uh, I asked uh, him afterwards, I said, you know, how did you learn that? I'm interested, I'm curious. And he talked about um, taking like every course he could get his hands on for five years. And I thought to myself, well, it might take me 10 years because maybe I don't have as much time as he has. Maybe I don't have as much money, you know. But he mentioned a course there at Kripalu, which was a week-long energy healing course. And I went back and took that the next year. And that was like polarity therapy and um, uh, chakra orc field work. Um, and while I was there, I met somebody like a longtime resident who at Corpolo or community member who was starting a training, like maybe the following year or something. And so I signed up for that. And that was like for a couple of years, we met every six weeks. So we recognized we were a community and that was like a smattering of techniques. Uh, and it included craniosacral, uh, and yoga and lots and lots of stuff. Uh, and, uh, the craniosacral really stood out to me as a technique that was essentially energy work, but was more grounded because you're working with the cranial wave or the inner tide or the CRI, cranial rhythmic impulse, whatever name, all the same thing, but whatever we want to call it, um, which was a physiological phenomenon. And tracking that meant that we could have a neutral correspondent for what was happening in the client. And energy work has this kind of nebulous realm. Uh, Hugh, Hugh Milne, who was one of my main teachers, calls the human energy field um, the dream body because it's where we manifest our hopes and dreams. And it's very slippery. And so there's always the potential to miss your client if you've got a practitioner, as a practitioner, if you've got something you really want and you don't, an unconscious view, a shadow, right? You can miss the client. You can believe you're having a certain experience. And I know I've experienced that both as a practitioner and a client that the practitioner said, oh, all this, all that, you know, and I've been like, that, that ain't happening. <laughs> you know, I'm like over here and I know I've done it as a practitioner. So the cranial work really stood out to me mm. as a way to be more precise. Nice. That's so cool. What an amazing blend. I mean, you've, you've done so much training. Do you, do you stay forever student? What, what training are you, are you taking a training right now in something? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm finishing up this year long, uh, Vajrayana Buddhist training. Got so, it. Nice. Yeah. And so that leads me to then wonder, like with your new book, the TMJ handbook, the TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint, our jaw, how did you get so specific with this particular issue? H how did that come about? Because that's so, such a specific thing to focus your all your work around. Can you give me a little bit of insight as to how that came about? Yeah, sure. Um, and I would preface this by saying, I don't think I ever at any time focused all my work around it because life mm -hmm. is just kind of too interesting. Yeah. Um, but it did present itself as a cranial practitioner, I'm trained to work with jaw tension. Um, and uh, there's really not a, much available for people who are suffering from what we call TMD, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction, or jaw tension or jaw pain. And it can have really vast repercussions throughout body uh, and mind if you're in a lot of pain. Certainly that can lead to a lot of distress. And if you can't find solutions, that can lead to even more distress. Um, and it can have lots of causes that come from uh, uh, mental health, physical health, structural, physiological, you know, just all over the map. So it's a, it's a very interesting condition from my viewpoint as a cranial practitioner. And people would come to me for help with that. And because I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and maybe because people know me as a yoga teacher and as a mindfulness instructor, 
my clients often did have a background in yoga and or mindfulness. And I became curious about whether I could support them uh, in their recovery through developing yoga, which was oriented towards uh, relieving uh, the jaw tension. Um, it's, um, ah, I, I totally spaced out what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll let you do it first and I'll, I'll get a chance to do it later too. So okay. yeah, you need to space out every now and again. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I'm curious how, in how the team, how you, what caused you to kind of like really go in on, let me just focus yoga technique, cranial technique, meditation technique that will help to alleviate TM disorder. Yeah. So, um, I guess Draw tension we'll... is really pervasive. It's yeah. uh, upwards of 30%, okay? And it's really uncomfortable. And your dentist can give you a night guard, right? Which mm. will mitigate the symptoms and the repercussions, but it's not going to stop you from clenching. Yeah. So you're going to bite down on plastic. And there is some benefit to that if it's well-designed in that you can't wear down the surface of your teeth, okay? Mm. Um, you need your teeth for your whole life <laughs> and yes. you only get you get two sets but one's gone by the time you're 10 or so <laughs> you know so that hopefully they're gonna have to last you a long time right um it can also a bite guard can also mitigate headaches and um jaw pain but it's not gonna stop you from clenching and people often feel it actually increases their clenching mm. um, and some people find it very uncomfortable and um you know wake up with it like thrown across the room <laughs> <laughs> others like it but not everyone feels that way yeah so um i was just curious about could i apply cranial sequel understands how this jaw is intertwined with the entire body mm. and so iyengar yoga also understands that we can work with one part of the body to influence another part of the body mm. so applying principles from cranial sequel of how we understand the jaw to be intertwined with the body. And then Iyengar yoga, which has this very interesting understanding of physiology. And particularly my teacher Ramanan Patel would work with the vayus, uh, the winds, the subtle winds from Ayurveda mm. um, called uh, vayu is just the word for wind, but the movement of energy in, in the body. So he described phenomena that were very similar to what we experience in craniosacral. And he described it as coming from the vayus, how the how the winds are, and how one action influences another wind, and that gives you a certain result. And he could do it systematically. Mm. In craniosacral, we could do a similar thing. We have a different explanation. So I just was very curious about could yeah. I develop some yoga? I like to support the autonomy of the client, and so I was curious about can I empower people to be involved in their own healing in this way. Yes. Is there the one one question I have, and I've I've come across this from first time I heard this was I was practicing with Richard Freeman in an Ashtanga style class, and he had made mention of a connection between the sacrum and the palate. And he kind of directed us toward, you know, sensing the roof of the mouth and then seeing if what kind of effect that would have on the sacrum. And I I was like, what? Like, I just never came across that before. Can you share a little bit about what you have come across in relation to areas that that seem to play off of jaw and or mouth troubles? Yeah, sure. I'm curious, did Richard Freeman, I've heard of him, I haven't ever had the opportunity to practice with him, but did he give any explanation for that phenomena? Ooh, you know, it was in a large workshop setting and out in California. And I don't remember that part of it. I just remember there was this um, just reference toward put attention on the roof of your mouth and then let that get your sacrum to, or the musculature around the sacrum to release, to relax. And uh, so it just, it kind of put my mind in a place that I'd never connected dots between i just never <laughs> i just didn't wasn't thinking about my my mouth the roof of my mouth my pelvis before so sure. I, I but it's so fascinating and i i'm curious um 
you know, if there's, if you have any insight around that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. Like the phenomena we can experience and then how do we explain it? Mm. And it can often be explained, you know, each paradigm has their own explanation or we could just experience it as phenomena but if you're a healer you want to kind of develop a systematic approach right so that you can replicate the results so um i just taught a workshop called uh the core link yoga and the core link head to hips connection so in craniosacral we recognize something called the core link which is uh the dural membranes the spinal membranes inside the spinal column connecting the sacrum with the skull because those membranes attach at the base of the skull a little bit at the top two vertebra but mostly the base of the skull and then they are continuous with the membranes within the cranium okay that are supporting your brain and allowing the fluids to move through the brain and then they those membranes attach at your sacrum okay but they're free flowing within the spinal column and so the cranial wave is transmitted through them those membranes are stiff enough that uh, they're fluid, but they're, they're, they have a stiffness to them uh, that they can transmit structural imbalances. So from the, my viewpoint as a cranial practitioner, it's like a super highway of information structurally. Yeah. There's right side body restriction or a left brain, right body restriction, or, you know, cause it can go a lot of different ways. So that's something like if someone has a, occipital lobe uh, a temporal lobe restriction that might manifest somewhere else in their body on the right side right yeah um so yeah so that's one way to view that um the other and i go into this in in the book so in the inner tide chapter i talk about some for me some of these bridges that we're building and that was some of my inspiration what i was learning from ramanan and what i was learning from humil and what i was experiencing in my own body so Ramanan can do similar things, and he explains it through the winds, the vayus. In Tibetan uh, medicine, it's called the rung. Um, and so he talks about how, uh, so there's five of them. There's the, uh, pra the pranas is another name, right? So there's one that goes from outside the body, like from the crown down to the um, uh, navel. There's one that goes, that counterposes that from the navel back up. Uh, and then there's one that goes, so the, the first one though is bringing information from outside in. Yeah. Yes. And then there's one that uh, goes from the navel down through the feet into the earth. That's the elimination, the apana by you. And then there's uh, one that expands from, from the heart outward. And there's one that uh, contracts from the, uh, that's a digestive from, so this circulatory here at the heart and digestive here in, in the lower abdomen. So what Ramanan would say is so someone would come in with like a headache, let's say, or sinus, sinus congestion. Um, and he would put them in a supported pose. And this was in a class of experienced uh, yoga practitioners. And so people can work with a lot of intent intelligence and sensitivity. And so they would be maybe in Dandasana or Upavista Kanasana, sitting on the floor, wide leg pose or straight leg pose uh, in the way that it was comfortable for them or in a Virasana. Uh, and then have support behind them, uh, and then maybe the walls behind them, or um, they have a bolster, whatever they need, right? Yes. Um, and then someone comes and stands at the tops of the of the thighs, um, and again, you know, they can support on the wall. So it's not this is not like a aggressive, uncomfortable thing. Something yeah. done with a lot of intelligence. It's like a sophisticated form of body work. Yes. Um, and then there would be a physiological change as the femur bone changes its position in the hip socket just a very subtle change and you can feel one's a little more forward than the other or you know and, and as it releases the phenomena would release the sinus was, would begin to flow or the headache would release right and his explanation and i've experienced all sides of that i've been the one uh, sitting on the ground with people i'm standing on my thighs i've been the one to stand on the thighs i've been the one to, in the room observing it and the way he explains that is the apanavayu, the lower breath needs to be, is blocked and needs to be freed up. And when that's freed up, the thoracic breath frees up and that's what's freeing the, um, the, the, the congestion in the head. So cool. I saw these two different explanations of the same phenomena, you know, and it was very intriguing to me. And I don't, I don't know that there's any one answer. I think that different paradigms, you know, acupuncturist explains it this way, craniosacral explains it this way, yoga yeah. explains it this way, right? Nice. 
great point. It's really cool to think about it from the angle of the like cerebral spinal fluid versus wind or the movement of 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 wind. Can you help me understand a little more about the Vayu concept in relation to is it is it like um explained that there is air traveling from one place to the other or is it more like you imagine that like i is that more of an energetic sort of energetic it's It's prana yeah it's prana yeah Yeah. and you know it it's not only energetic though because the energy influences the physiology Mm. right you know why do we get a stomach ache well maybe we ate something bad maybe we ate something we can't digest Maybe we're anxious. Maybe we've uh, we're anxious enough that we've pulled up our roots from our feet, and we're simply not circulating energy down into our roots, into our feet, and so energy is getting congested, and you can't digest food, and then you have a stomach ache, right? Yes, Instead yes. of going, the energy is flowing down and out. They've reversed to come back up, and then if you get if you actually throw up, that's like the energy has reversed so strongly to forcefully push something out of the body. That makes sense. When in relation to your initial illness and then seeking solutions and then diving into this world immensely or with a lot of, you know, you've been at it for a long time. Have you had any clarity about what the cause of your initial chronic illness was? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't think that I can say there was one cause. I can see a variety of causes. Mm. Um, Certainly, um, I think the stress of college, like understanding my personality and that strong performative stress was uh, a big part of it. And I simply didn't understand it. And then I would say that... um, I was sensitive enough to be affected by how I was eating and not that I was eating particularly poorly, but, you know, I've learned a lot through Ayurveda and Chinese medicine and the Tibetan Ayurveda about how to uh, balance myself through what I eat, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so that um, I was on crew my last couple of years there and that was up at 5 a.m. And I, I think I just was, I didn't have any sense of my limits, you know? Yeah. Um, I do also think there was a, um, uh, you know, so there was also trauma in my early childhood history that I wasn't really aware of. So I was just kind of like doing, living an unconscious life, putting myself out there and and so um, that I think that trauma as being on my own kind of came more into play, you know, mm. um, and that the challenges for my nervous system to meet the demands upon it, you know. Yes. And then the last thing I'll say about it is that I think it was also a spiritual Ill- illness in some way. It was absolutely a physical physiological illness, but also, you know, where I had this sense of reconnection with the yoga and the meditation and the healing. I feel that there's like in in Buddhism, we talk about spiritual messengers. Um, You know, that's how the Buddha got on the path uh, before he was a Buddha, when he was a prince, Um, the, uh, these Deva spirits appeared as someone who was old, someone who was sick and someone who was dying. And they uh, sparked in the, the Prince Siddhartha, the desire to awaken, to find a way to help people out of these guaranteed miseries in life. And I feel like there was some aspect that was like, Peter's not living the life she could live. You know, uh-huh. like she needs a yes. little redirection here. <laughs> yes. Well, I like that. I like that fr- framing it in that context is, <laughs> is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Do you, is it, a, is that a level now that you have been steady enough for long enough that you don't have any reoccurrences or is it something that you need to still really just kind of be careful? You know, is it something that's like in the past or is it something that like, if you eat like crazy and do wild and go crewing at 4am and, and all that stuff that you have this reoccurrence situation? Yeah, no, it's definitely both. I I am very uh, mindful and attentive of my lifestyle, um, which I think is important for anyone. And, and, and particularly as we are on a spiritual path or a healing path, you know, that's fundamental to 
our um, to uh, uh, awareness to yeah. you know we want to create a stable life as much as we can um, and I think anyone who um, really tests those limits is is met you know um, mm -hmm. is met with with certain challenges so um, yeah I'm, I'm very careful with what I eat and with my diet and with my lifestyle I have I have more wiggle room for sure yeah um, and I also take significant breaks you know for me about every decade uh, i mean I, I do regular meditation retreats you know a month or two a year and about every decade i feel a strong need for a, a big break you know like um six months retreat or um uh, yeah just taking a lot of time have you when you do a six month retreat is that like you going into a cabin in the woods and self uh retreating or is this you going into a structured retreat environment yeah, both. I've done I've done all of the above. Um, lately, I've been practicing a lot at the Forest Refuge in Barrie, Massachusetts, which is affiliated with the Insight Meditation Society. And then um, it's it's a separate facility there on that same campus, and it's designed for long term retreatants. It's designed for people who have an established meditation practice. So it's limited to thirty people. There are thirty single rooms there, wow. and there's just a very bare bones schedule structure mm. um like the meals are out at certain times and a few talks a week and a few meetings with a meditation teacher but other than that you set your own schedule and that's really where i where i uh floor i feel like for me meditation is a lot of deep listening to my own rhythms you know so that was it works very well for me that sounds amazing what a cool way to structure it where you have you know you have meals prepared so it's not like you still have to go into town grocery shop cook for yourself but at the same time, a loose schedule, like, like you get to kind of figure out what you want to do and not, oh, hear the bell at 4 a.m. Although you're probably up at 4 a.m. meditating <laughs> so much free time. You're like, I'm here. I'm not, what else am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. People are different. And it's something you find as you develop your meditation practice more mm -hmm. is finding your own rhythm. Some people stay up very late. Some people get up early. Um, you know, getting sleep is a part of meditation practice for sure. And we each need different uh, amounts of sleep, but my personal experience and, you know, healing from chronic fatigue and understanding my nervous system is that it's really important for me to rest and I'm more attentive and more at ease when I rest. Yeah. How are you with handling, taking in information about world news these days? Because are you needing to cut that off, not look and focus on yourself so it doesn't get overwhelming? Or are you able to engage with that and process it in a healthy way and, and move forward? Yeah, really good question. I actually just wrote about this in my last uh, email out to my, you know, my, just my uh, client, my little email list. Nice. Um, you know, I'm actually, the world is very interesting right it's now. It's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, where do we even, where do we put our finger? You know, and it's like you put your finger to try to touch on something and it, it how do you make sense of it? You know, it's like, it's incredible. I mean, I'm very intrigued, but it's definitely seems a little more intense than I. It's very I interesting and um, it can be overwhelming. Um yeah. I have gone many, many years in the past without reading the newspaper. I'm actually more interested in reading the newspaper now. It kind of started during the pandemic. Um, and I have more space for it overall. There are certainly days when, and it really has less to do with the news that's being reported and more to do with my, yeah. my flow. If I'm tired or if I've been more busy than usual, yes. then I'll be like, yeah, no, not today, you know? Um, but I have, you know, I have, I, I will admit to having on my phone uh, apps for the SF Chronicle, the New York Times, and Washington Post. And I'm not advocating at all for anyone to do this or not do this. For me, <laughs> I'm just very interested and curious. And yeah. um, that's an easy way for me to get the information and also to leave it and to ignore it. Um, yeah, good it, point. Yeah. And it's not, sometimes it could be because it's unpleasant. It has less to do with it being unpleasant uh, for me at this stage. At other times, it absolutely was because it's unpleasant. Now it has more to do with me just recognizing where my nervous system is at, how I'm feeling and what makes, what's a wise choice for that day. 
Yeah. Doesn't it seem so important more than ever to have some sort of meditation and or spiritual practice currently? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm a believer. <laughs> uh, now we don't have to twist each other's arm here. <laughs> no, you know, it's, you know, it's fundamental. Come on, Gator, I really think, yeah. <laughs> and it has been for, you know, my whole adult life. You yeah. Know, so. Yeah. Amazing. Is there anything that you've come across lately? If we just, let's stay or clear politics, but is there anything that you've come across recently that you've had to really kind of not wrestle on if wrestle is the right word, but just like attack or maybe that's not the right word either. Uh, come at from different angles to make sense of something. Has there been a, a say again, please. I'm not sure what you mean. I guess I know it's very vague. Um, has there, is there an issue or an article or something in our world that you're viewing today that you've really kind of had to research a little deeper into that through that research process, you've gained clarity. Do you know what I mean? Like sometimes I, my own one for me personally is I watched a show on Netflix called Dairy Girls, which was about Northern Ireland. And it, it was, it was entertaining. And then I realized, oh my gosh, I really don't know any of the history of what happened in Ireland back in the seventies with the, like the, all that stuff that was going on between the Catholics and the Protestants. And then I realized I don't even know what Protestantism is. And then I started reading about Pro the Protestant Reformation. And then I just kind of kept going further and further, but then I hit a point where I was like, I think it makes a little more sense to me now. And I, and I felt some clarity because I did a little homework and I'm wondering if you had anything recently, I'm sure it'd be completely different to that, but is there anything recently that you've gotten curious about, dug in on and had a moment of clarity? Yeah, probably. But I guess what it all boils down to really is, you know, the Buddha was very clear um, and, uh, you know, greed and uh, aversion <laughs> and confusion are really the fundamental sources of, of struggle. Mm. And we see that getting played out all the time, again and again and again and again. We would not have a desire to harm anyone ever if we had resolved our anger, our greed, mm. and our confusion. You know, those are fear, right? So it, it all does, without question, very clearly come back to our personal need for safety, our personal desire for protection. Um, and to feel loved and cared for and a part of something greater than ourselves. And sometimes people are, are in positions of power where they can inflict tremendous suffering upon, you know, millions of people, right? And it still comes back to their personal need for, um, uh, for some kind of acknowledgement, right? So I see that very clearly and I'm mm -hmm. not confused by mm -hmm. that. And, Love that. Um, everyone, you know, has goodness in them, even if it's not showing up, you know? Um, and so we can, the, the Buddha was so, you know, he just said, this stuff is going to happen. This is fundamental to the world. If you imagine, we would love to imagine a world without it. And we can try and imagine a world without it. And we can try to create a world without it, but it's endemic to humanity and how the world functions. So that recognition certainly helps me to see into what is going on. Great answer. Thank you. I love that. In relation to yoga kundalini chakras and cerebral spinal fluid and the study of it and or application of manipulation of it in cranial sacral therapy, do you see a connection? Yeah, it's such a great question. And when you wrote that, I started, I had to think about it, you know, and I mean, I see, it's a big question it is. and I see, I can say some things that I see, what I understand. Please. I see Kundalini as a completely organic force and not something to be feared. It's just natural. It's there. Um, and it's a benevolent force. Um, so for me, in my practice, I, I don't want to control it. It's just, um, it's like, I don't do any strong breath control practices at this stage of my practice. You know, early on, maybe I did some of that, but I haven't for many years because it just doesn't feel like it would be helpful to me. So it's just letting something natural flow and manifest. It's just there. It's for our 
goodness for our development. Um, it's it's a wholesome, positive thing. So it isn't something to be feared um, or, in my view, controlled. And I think what craniosacral might, you know, what it can help, it can help, help with spiritual emergencies for sure. It can help with grounding and opening and um, stability and you know, uh, so I've certainly worked with people in all of those sorts of states, you know, people who were suicidal or people who were in a lot of distress and which sometimes might be called like Kundalini uh, crises, right? Um, spiritual emergencies, right? And so craniosacral can certainly help uh, to stabilize that. It can also help with our personal growth and development in that um, it's just facilitating the ease of body and mind and integration mm. great answer and i like the fact that you have respect and or just a relaxation around the idea of kundalini that's nice that feels rela that feels just comforting <laughs> It's a big, yeah, people kind of get all kind of tied in a knot around it because it's sort of <laughs> mysterious, you know? Um, I, I mean, remember what, when I was... What is it and how do I make it and how do I force it and how could I control it? And I like that you're just like, no, it's natural and let's just relax about it. <laughs> That's good. I remember I was in a bookstore, maybe it was at Kripalo ages ago, and there was a book on Kundalini and it was like this thick book, like inches thick. And I was intrigued by it. You know, I, I don't think I ever read the book, but since then... <laughs> <laughs> my views have evolved <laughs> yes yes good point good point um where in relation and if i come back a little bit to the tmj um aspect i do clench a lot and my dentist said todd if you don't put one of these night guards on you're not gonna have any teeth left and um, so I'm like, well, I guess I am stressed out. You know, I didn't know I was. It's, I'm doing it all while I'm sleeping. I had no idea. Um, so do you have any advice for me in relation to I'm aware that I'm clamping and then I, of course, I become aware and then I relax and I can just get in that kind of, it must be a nervous system thing or just like a hyped up where I'll just like, oh, just clamp down. In relation to sleep though, have you come across technique beyond just putting something in between your teeth to make sure you don't wear it down uh, that can because I'm obviously we're asleep we don't know what we're doing is there something is there a way to know what we're doing while we're sleeping <laughs> yeah yeah it's a good question and you know I get this one a lot in in the workshops that I teach um, the TMJ yoga and mindfulness workshops um and as you say, when we're sleeping, it, it's difficult to control that, which is kind of the beauty of sleep. <laughs> Good point. Good point. That's why we like it. Just shut off for a minute. Yes. Sleep is a yeah. wonderful thing. <laughs> we, we, need, we need our rest. You know, the mind needs a break, you know. So it's very common that what's unconscious during the day arises in, in, in our sleep. Um, as well as, the, the, you know, again, draw attention is very complex there's lots of layers to your question so one thing to recognize is bruxism you know, the grinding that can happen is also an adaptive mechanism of the body it's trying to fix something that's out of balance so mm -hmm. young children uh grind the bruxism is natural as part of losing their baby teeth it's part of what's a function that's going to loosen them up so bruxism is a natural instinct and has a certain role to play. So um, there's so many factors that can come into what causes jaw tension and stress is just one. And it's one that aggravates whatever might already be there. Mm. So car accidents, slip and fall injury, blows to the head. If you have a misalignment in your neck, that's going to show up in your jaw. Mm. Every time you open and close your mouth, the fulcrum or axis for that movement is between the top two vertebra. Mm. And that's because your jaw has the capacity to move forward and back. Yeah, if you put, you can do a little experiment. If you kind of, if you sweep up your neck and then you find this point that kind of pushes out a little bit, that's the occipital bone there. And then you go back down and you feel how it goes in a little bit. Mm. And then just there with a very light quality, you'll feel more with a light quality of touch. So not like massage manipulation, just very light quality of touch. And open and close your mouth and see if you feel just a little tiny activation under your finger. Mm -hmm. 
You feel something moving there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one way you can get, but don't nod your head while you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why I was so profound. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> <laughs> that's one way you can begin to experience that connection directly. That's something we recognize in craniosafe role. That's called Guze's theorem. It was recognized by Guze, the engineer who worked with a dental group back in the 1900s um, to understand more about this. So in yoga, that's a really important piece, the connection between neck and jaw. And it's the one of the reasons that I do not advocate for head compressive inversions if someone is working with jaw tension. So a traditional head balance where your head is on the floor or other head compressive inversions, I would recommend that you take a break from that if you're trying to understand your habit of jaw tension yeah. and you can develop it. You could go back to it another time when you have, I mean, you can keep doing it if you want, but if you want to understand this relationship, give it a break for a little while. And then when you go back, you can feel more of what's happening. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, getting, uh, working on some passive traction there in a younger yoga, we use the ropes and the slings a lot. Um, that can be a way to help to free up the neck. And, um, you know, I mean, I have a whole kind of systematic approach where we're doing what we call core actions, which are these postural alignment techniques, um, focused on jaw, neck, uh, sorry, jaw, shoulders, hips, and feet. And then we apply that to how we do yoga poses. Um, so it's a program that's going to bring awareness. It's not that I can like fix it like that. It's going to bring awareness so that you can begin to develop the uh, understanding of the patterns of tension. We all live on a continuum, a spectrum of more tense to less tense. So we can start to know our patterns and we can start to recognize when they're getting activated, whether it's the right hip that tightens, the left side neck that gets sore, the jaw, whatever, wherever we feel those pinpoints, then we can realize like, oh, okay, stress is developing. Can I back it down? What can I do to help myself? Can I do guided meditation? Can I do conscious relaxation? Can I go for a walk? Can I do some yoga? Nice. For those of us that I have your book now, but is there a way that, do you teach online? Is there a way to take class with you to learn that? Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, I will be, te uh, my workshops are often hybrid, um, so people can join from wherever they are. I'm still setting up my fall schedule, and I'm just in the process of turning the TMJ yoga and mindfulness workshop into an online course. Mm -hmm. So that will be available on demand uh, sometime this fall. Nice. Excellent, Kater. Oh my gosh, I'm yeah. so, I'm so thankful to have this chance to meet you, and I really appreciate you donating your time so so we can we can learn a little bit and I, I really enjoyed uh, having this conversation. I'm so thankful to Michael for introducing us and I can find you on your website, which I know you said you have a new one coming out, which is going to be your name.com so katershakoy.com and I can find you I, I do follow you on Instagram. Is there anything else that is there a question I missed? Is there something, I, I, is there something I should have asked you? <laughs> <laughs> the book's official release date is August 27th. So it's available for pre-order right now, directly from the publisher, Shambhala. It's on Amazon. Um, and then it'll, it, it'll ship to you, uh, on the 27th, uh, whoever's interested in getting it. And, um, you can get it, of course, at your local bookstore, uh, after August 27th. I mean, that's really amazing. How did you get Shambhala to, how did you, you must've done a big jump for joy when you got that call that said, <laughs> you just received, you're going to get published by Shambhala, Shambhala. Don't you think? I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. Well, really I mean, I did approach them. You know, we did have yeah. a conversation. <laughs> yeah. I did, it was like they I just called say, you out of thin air. Said, ah. <laughs> You're like, I did work for it. Like, I put a little bit of time in. It wasn't just like the universe reaching out and telling me. But still, that's so cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, they've been oh. wonderful. They're oh, a man. wonderful publisher. I'm very happy to have worked with them. They're great things about them. Well, Thank you so much, Cater. I can't wait to release this and have everybody get a chance to listen. And I, do you ever travel to Florida? When's the last um, time you're in the East Coast? We can it talk like about you, that. <laughs> it sounds like you were in um, Massachusetts. That's still a long ways away, but it is East Coast. Yeah. 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 No, I travel around to a variety of places. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I hope to get a chance to meet you in person. And this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much, Cater. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Lots of fun. Thank you. <laughs>